So, ich freue mich, Sie alle zu unserer siebten Vorlesung im Rahmen von diesem Vorlesungszyklus mit 17 die Welt retten begrüßen zu dürfen. Heute ist, Sie sehen es alle, das SDG 7 dran und wir haben den Gast aus Zürich, den Ludger Hovestadt, hier unter uns und ich möchte möglichst schnell ihm das Wort übergeben, aber ich werde ihn natürlich noch davor etwas vorstellen, wenn man schon so prominente Leute hat, dann darf man das auch ähm, erzählen. Ludger Hovestadt ist Architekt und Informatiker und seit 2000 Professor für Computer Aided Architectural Design an der ETH Zürich. Er ist in Gelsenkirchen geboren, hat an der RWTH Aachen studiert und an der HFG Wien eine Meisterklasse bei Professor Holzbauer, also auch eine Zeit lang in Wien studiert. Nach seinem Diplom 1987 arbeitet er als wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter und Assistent bei Professor Haller bzw. später dann bei Professor Kohler an der Technischen Universität in Karlsruhe, wo er auch äh, promoviert hat. Und dann hat er eine Vertretungsprofessur an der Uni Kaiserslautern gehabt, ehe er dann 2000 nach Zürich berufen wurde. Er arbeitet an der Grenze der Berechenbarkeit und versucht, komplexe Informationstechnologien in der Architektur verfügbar zu machen. Er ist Gründer mehrerer Firmen in den Bereichen digitale Fabrikation, intelligente Gebäudetechnik und zuletzt in der Digitalisierung unserer Stromnetze. Und das ist auch der Grund, warum man, das ist ja zunächst mal überraschend, dass man zu diesem Thema saubere Energie einen Architekten hier einlädt. Er hat dieses Buch, A Genius Planet, From Energy, From Scarcity to Abundance, A Radical Pathway, gemeinsam mit Vera Bühlmann und Sebastian Michael äh, 2017 veröffentlicht, das aber seit 2012 versucht zu veröffentlichen. Das heißt, das, was da in dem Buch beschrieben ist, war zumindest 2012 noch kontroversiell. Und äh, darüber wird er uns jetzt gleich noch mehr erzählen. Ich möchte aber noch ein paar andere Publikationen auch äh, erwähnen. Er hat seit 2009 seinen Schwerpunkt von der Anwendbarkeit zur Grundlagenforschung, zum Verhältnis von Architektur und Information verschoben und äh, hat quasi 2009 mit diesem Buch Jenseits des Rasters Architektur und Informationstechnologie wie so ein Kapitel in der Arbeit an der ETH Zürich abgeschlossen und seither arbeitet er sehr viel theoretischer. Da sind dann erschienen Printed Physics, Metallicum Series äh, 2012, Sheaves, When Things Are Whatever Can Be The Case oder 2013, Eigenarchitecture, Computability as Literacy oder dann 2015, A Quantum City, Mastering the Generic und dann eben 2017, wie schon erwähnt, A Genius Planet, Energy from Scarcity to Abundance, A Radical Pathway. Also ich freue mich sehr, dich heute hier begrüßen zu dürfen, Ludger, und hätte mir gewünscht, dass noch ein paar mehr auch hier den Weg zu uns in die Aula gefunden hätten, aber ähm, das wird wie immer auch wieder aufgezeichnet werden und wir können dann hoffen, dass die Leute, die das heute verpassen, das später per Video sich anschauen werden. Auch wieder schon jetzt möchte ich darauf hinweisen, dass wir dann... zu diskutieren äh, mit diesem Würfel, der dann rumgeworfen wird. So ist das hier in der Aula. So. Und das hat unter anderem dann auch den Zweck, dass das, was in diesen Würfel gesprochen wird, nicht nur hier besser verständlich ist, sondern auch mit aufgezeichnet wird. Also, das genug der Vorrede. Jetzt bitte ich Sie, ach so, noch was, um dir diese Frage ein bisschen abzunehmen. Ob das Englisch oder Deutsch sein soll. Will, will ähm, mal eine kleine Saalabstimmung dazu machen. Scheinbar gab es im Rahmen dieser Vorlesungsreihe noch nie einen englischsprachigen Vortrag. Der Titel wurde auch deutsch versendet. Ich habe ihn jetzt auch deutsch eingeführt. Wie viele hätten denn was dagegen, uh, if we switch to English and did the rest of today in English, would that be fine for everybody?
So that's perfect. So that's so then please help me welcome Lutka Hoverstein. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the introduction, Urs. Um, yeah, this is a strange uh, <laughs> situation. You, and it was, has a kind of odyssey with uh, our research. So we uh, did all these kind of uh, research in how to apply computing and, and architecture from at the ETH um, from 2000 to 2000, around 2010. So and then uh, we uh, somehow uh, covered the range of, of applications. Then these companies uh, had been founded, and uh, five out of six are still alive, and so it's a relatively good uh, ratio. And this is a, a, it's a broad spectrum of different applications. So and then there was this uh, key uh, moment around 2008 where we had, um, so me, I'm in, in computing and architecture, and I never liked computer graphics. So I always an uh, artificial intelligence guy. So and uh, I'm in the structure of buildings. So it's uh, and not in the geometry of things. So I don't like it. And I'm a student of Fritz Haller. And Fritz Haller is the most manieristic, uh, functionalistic uh, architect. So and it's all about structures, it's about uh, the growth of, crystal, of crystalline growth and so on. And uh, this is the uh, group theory, uh, this is category theory, mathematics and so on. It's, it's not, uh, not in the first step uh, about uh, forms and geometry. So which is a little strange if you get a chair of computer-aided architectural design. It's a strange uh, relation. I tried two times to change the name, my colleagues always wanted to put me there and keep it <laughs> as uh, computer graphics. So <clears throat> then in 2008, we uh, succeeded with these uh, artificial intelligence things uh, to win a kind of Turing test. So we uh, had a fully automatic architectural design. We gave it anonymously to a competition and won a prize with that. So this is 10 years, nine, 10 years ago. So, and uh, that was kind of shocking, interesting, and so on. So there are two ways how to react on that. First, you can have, okay, then we make 1,000 competitions a year anonymously. So nobody likes it, this story, or liked that story at that time. I think they still don't like it. So there was no way to to work with uh, with an investor and so on with these kind of things. So for example, you can have a, an enormous refinement uh, and an uh, enormous level of adaptivity to, uh, to, to the customers or the people's uh, individual needs. But you never can address that by design of hand. You simply have thousands of uh, yeah, most very often contradicting uh, interests of people. With these tools, you can shake them, and 92% are happy. And if you do it by hand, you maximum are with 75, 80, or so, just to take some numbers. So this, so, and for example, with an investor, it would be great that he can st sell his building <laughs> just without. A, a specific design. So you can ask the people, how do you want to live? And then he sells what they want, so not what there is. So it's just the other way around. So customers first. So that's what we are experiencing in the market today with these AI techniques and in, in internet. So all these stories are not enough. So they like to invest a few hundred thousand euros for a new investment to make a nice brochure and so on <coughs> to sell and proper designed uh, a building, sell it as it is designed, instead of asking people, what do you want? To address this certain thing in a certain profile and so on. All this was not enough that any investor wanted to get in touch with the story that there is a machine doing the design. It's, they burn their brand by that. So it's an ugly story. No, it's a kind of, and it's still a kind of hatred to this uh, uh, love and hatred story to that. It's very complicated. And I will tell a similar thing <clears throat> with the energy as well. So therefore it's a kind of odyssey what I want to, want to talk about. 
So this was our experience, and uh, then we say, yeah, then you can have to be the ugly guy, do 1,000 uh, designs per year, <laughs> don't talk about it, and just win it, and, or not, or whatever, just go into production of these things, make a kind of engineered, creative architectural design. So, or, and this is why we made the step back, you say, if what we say, and what we receive uh, 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 as, or, or uh, understand as architecture is with the machines. What is architecture then? So therefore we are for 10 years now reasoning about getting a step, getting a step back and try to reason about what architecture is about if what we think it is, is to the machines. And these times with machine intelligence, big data, and so on, these topics get very recent. Huh? So it's now so it, now it's getting vivid. This, this topic, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, question. So we made this uh, step back. Uh, we uh, now we we are uh, <clears throat> thinking about the principal architectural theory, philosophy, mathematics, and uh, machine intelligence. Uh, that's a, the kind of uh, theory in computer science and so on. This is what we are what we are doing. And at the beginning, because of my company, there was a strange uh, uh, story. I've, I've, so that with all these uh, scarcities around, with the discussions about energy, the energy turn, and so on, and I was in the. Uh, I made a small machine, a small chip which uh, is, a, is a computer, it's a power supply, it's a communication device via power line. So it's a small chip, two by two millimeters, which is fully operatable just if you put it directly without any transformator uh, to, to, uh, to the electricity. And it's 0.1 watt, watt to operate, which means you can put it into any piece of plastic and you don't have problems with heat and so on. So, and because it's two by two millimeters, the principal price for it is one dollar. So you can put it everywhere. So in the socket of a lamp and uh, then control the energy, you switch it and the thing is on internet just with the power line. And you can't um, uh, uh, manipulate it or hear it if you not touch the, the, the electricity line. So you have to enter the house to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get the data. Quite different from, uh, from the existing systems. So it's very nice technology, and it works. I, I told you because I really like it. <laughs> Normally, power line is 230 volt, 230 volt, and there's a lot of. If you make your, um, if your washing machine is on or your uh, your Hoover, then there's a lot of noise there, which means uh, 230, uh, 230 volt is a is a nice, clear idea of how it should work, but it's like this. So plus minus 20 is nothing. So in a high frequency. So and therefore, if you want to communicate like we're doing it with internet, now we have these plugs, put it in, uh, put internet there and uh, get it out on, on another place. So uh, then you have to put uh, 30, 40 volts in high frequency on top of this 200 to overlay this noise on the wave. And this means always that you have to fight noise and you have to struggle with these uh, high energy, so with this 230 volt and so on. By that you need three, four, five watt. You need these big pieces of electronics and so on. So on our trick to get that to a square a cubic millimeter <laughs> is just that we, uh, if the power gets down to uh, five volts, then it's communicating. And if it's lower than minus five volt, it's, uh, it's uh, stopping. It goes in shelter mode, waiting for the next five volt uh, uh, section in time, communicating, communicating. <laughs> and by that, we don't have to fight with this amount of noise, with the big uh, 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 voltage, and so on. And by that, we are down. We've in, in size, super small, 
and we are down in energy. So it's 0.1 watt, which it counts as no consumption. So to be intelligent with all these smart devices. So that's a nice thing. <laughs> and by that, you simply think about it. it can, uh, <clears throat> this device, for example, can measure then the energy consumption of the thing what is uh, connected. You can control it, you can, uh, so then for example, then uh, this device can trade energy. So for example, a washing machine simply can uh, make contracts. So your fridge, very simple example. So the fridge is a storage device. So the fridge can trade energy. So uh, if there's cheap energy somewhere, you can ask and make a, a contract, then he's cooling down for cheap money to get, <laughs> yeah, to get it cool as a storage device. So you don't have to pay or to load uh, uh, energy if there is a few, or if other loads are in your, uh, uh, in your uh, local system and so on, because the peaks are uh, expensive and you have to pay for the, for the peaks. So if you cut the peaks, so for example, this washing machine says, now I have to heat, then the fridge can say, okay, then I stop to, uh, to nivel, uh, nivelate uh, the whole consumption. Or you can buy it overnight. To have, so what these kind of stories. So that's very clear, can do that. And the idea is then that we thought electricity is a logistical system on, on energy. So it's not about resources, it's about logistics in energy. So trading it. And uh, electricity is like this around the globe. Nothing to do with localities or with, uh, with resources and so on. So it's not a logical thing. You can't grasp it. It's just, and it's not uh, like, for example, <clears throat> a candle or a piece of wood. You can, electricity is whatever you want to do with it. Light, music, whatever. So whatever you like, you can make it cold, you can make it warm, and so so it depends. You can uh, run your screen, the microphone. It's electricity. So it's it's an abstraction of of the things. So and it's not specific what to do with it, which is very interesting to understand what energy is and what electricity is. So it's a logistical system. So knowing this, developing stuff for the databases, these chips, these communication devices, bringing that to internet and so on. The story about what is going on in the discussion about scarcities in energy, the ecological footprint and so on, was crazy. So then we thought, I will tell you, <laughs> can't be. Yeah, it had been a lot of conferences talked about and so on. And therefore, it's about the principle abundance of clean energy. And it's a super clear story. And the interesting thing is nobody likes it. So we wrote this book, <laughs> 2012. We checked three agencies, 40 to 60 publishers, and they all say it's written in a proper way, it's a very nice book, but it doesn't fit to our profile of, uh, as publisher. Very interesting. So. It's not saying what I'm not saying. That, so what I'm not doing is what is all around. Two things. First, I don't think there will. I, I don't like the idea that there will be a catastrophe soon, and make reason for you to follow my arguments because of necessity. I think this is tyrannic. So to say, first the planet is going is going down. There will be a catastrophe. I will show you a solution. So my work is a solution for saving the planet. So I simply can't stand this kind of, uh, of, of talks. And this is all around. So I don't do that. I think I'm optimistic. We are smart and it's going relatively well if you look at numbers and so on. Or if me looking at my living conditions towards my kids, towards my parents, my grandparents, I can't complain. It's somehow proper. <laughs> so, <laughs> in comparison. So, and then there are certain statistical numbers you can look at. But it's somehow out of fashion to be 
not super negative, dystropic, and so on. So this was one story. And the second is, I don't, and you will see that there is no solution, because there's no problem. So what this implies, if you have this abundance, <laughs> if there's an abundance, and you push it in a certain direction, it's exploding like a bump, it's of course, yeah? So what you have to learn is, you have to get outraged about the nonsense, but you should not get engaged in any way. You should calm down, because this athletic engagement in things is with the machines. And they are good in that. And we, if we start to run and compete with these machines, we are lost. Or if two parties, as now we see two parties, <laughs> they think I'm right, I'm right, with all these kind of principle abundance, pff, that clash, yeah? like in cinema a thousand times, and, and so on. That's a very clear uh, a story. So, and we, we are not selling, not addressing any direct problem, nor providing any solution. But I want to engage you in two things. <laughs> that is beautiful, <laughs> that we are smart and our planet is beautiful, and yes, that you can trust your intellect. So, this is what I want to, to say. And this is not fashion. No Therefore, we took five years and then we published this in our, in our uh, series, uh, theory series. It, principally, it's written as a, as, a, um, as a popular science book, super simple to read, um, but we didn't succeed in that. And we made mistakes. So, and this, my, my story will be about that. So, normally, as you start to you know, see now with my beginning, I stopped around 2008, 2010, <laughs> making PowerPoints. So now, if I want to go into depth in a certain topic, I do it with Mathematica, and do it with some coding, and, and, so, and so on, and showing the principles and the concepts. And uh, normally, I don't have any slides anymore, because I think it's better to listen than to look to these shitty points. But you ask me for this. <laughs> for this uh, uh, abundance on uh, energy. So the, the backbone of this and all the pictures and so on, they are six, seven, eight years old. So and I somehow repolished it a little and I will tell you these uh, stories with new words. So therefore, now I have a PowerPoint. First time for two years now at least. <clears throat> now. So there will be two certain chapters uh, today. This is being a businessman <laughs> and uh, running, uh, looking for investors and so on. The story is super strong. So these are the fantastic three of our current uh, story. So the first is scarcities. So this is, yeah, we have to plan uh, to, sa to save our planet. It's a kind of a hybrid, but first is we need scarcities. Everybody has to agree that there is not enough for us. So then they follow your line of argumentation. So it's like the Rattenfinger of Hameln. That's it. So this is in, uh, in Hambach. This is where I grew up. And I earned my first money. So the second is catastrophes. Katrina and so on. Then we say, yes, it's really bad. Yeah? It's not only that <coughs> it's scar. Nature is punishing us. So I don't know whether it's true or not. I simply say to you, it's a perfect storyline for uh, setting up a company and making a brand. Yeah? So because third is technology. That's the solution for that. So the <laughs> green people, all the company, and they all do the same. They say, the Club of Rome, they say, it's really bad. You have to take care and buy our stuff. Otherwise, we are down. We are, we are out. So, and then we say, and then it gets religious. We say, that's the truth. <laughs> so, and then we say, we sell super systems. So they are super complicated and they're super expensive. 
So I don't know whether it's, so I don't want to take position. I simply say, this is a perfect setup if you want to sell your stuff. You can't do better. So, <laughs> so now thinking, not being pushy, athletic. So the problem with, <coughs> with, the, with the actual setup is that we all start to, we think we have to run. And we have to compete with the computers, with the machines and so on. We have to run. So it's, we have to go, we have to yeah, get outraged. We have to stand up and say, what's going on here? So think smart. That's it. So it's about thinking, not running. <laughs> so, and thinking is in circles, not directional. Therefore, it's not about effect, uh, cause and effect and so on. It's always direction, directional. This is with machine intelligence. They are super in that. So you make all the reasons you want. So I got friend with two, two levels. I got friend with everybody on this planet, eight billion people, three steps with, with, with Facebook, maybe two, I don't know, maybe six, it doesn't matter. I'm friend with everybody on this planet. Great, yeah. But <laughs> I am connected via three steps with any crime on this planet as well. <laughs> with all the terrorist attacks and so on, I'm involved, of course. Three steps and so on. You can make all arguments, any argument, it's always true. You simply name three arguments, but put it there. All the facts. This is what we call post factish. It's all the same story. If everything is connected, nothing makes sense anymore. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and we experience that in politics and so on. You can, whatever you do, <laughs> there's always a reason. Whatever you look and so on. Therefore, you can't trust answers anymore. It's about having smart questions. And the smart questions are a kind of rotation. You rotate around, like in your nice baroque setups, and you rotate all this stuff of this world around you, and either you can rotate it and have a clear point as a person, educated, connected, or you aren't. And that is about rotation. And this, uh, this and about the intellect and this athletic running is with the machines. So we will go further on that. So, and these are super uh, uh, simple contradictions to what we believe what these companies are selling us. For example, these exponential growth yeah, of information technology. So for example, in 10 years, six out of seven billion people got a mobile phone. This was uh, 2012. So, yeah, and this means this is an, a logarithmic uh, um, a, a curve of, of growth, and you see the, uh, the memory of your computers, computing power, the connectivity of our computers, and so on. There is no limit of growth. Obviously not. So it is a clear contradiction to the ecological footprint, and so on. The driver of what we are experiencing this day, what we are afraid of, and so on, is explicit as so simple, so explicitly not connected to the sensible things. For example, now, now I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still astonished. So it's four, now it took me four weeks, I'm still astonished. <laughs> it's, it's a micro SIM card for my mobile phone, this thing, 40, dollar, 40 euros, and it's 200 or 100, 256 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes. It's not these fakes of a terabyte from just, so, but it's a real thing. <laughs> I, I put this amount of, of data on it. It's 128 gigabytes for 40 euros in three by three millimeters. And this is a library of 500 movies. I don't believe it's there. It's, it's there. It's physically there. If you go with, with microphone, so I can't believe it that this is possible. 
and it has nothing to do anymore with so there are um, these these limits of growth and uh, it's, it's and it's 40, 40 euros. The same with these bandwidths. Now they sell for 49 Swiss francs, so it's 40 euros a month. They sell 10 gigabits up and download uh, internet with glass fiber a month, flat rate. This is a full HD 4K movie in one second. And they sell it for flat rate for 40 euros a month. There is not a limit of growth. So I think it's very important. <laughs> when we are schizophrenic with these things, we always say yes, but, uh huh. <laughs> and then yes, but, I know it, and I can feel it, and I just like the movies, but, yeah. It's, it's not, it's schizophrenic. No, it's not rational what we are talking about these things. So this is the same with this. So we're always complaining and so on that uh, people <coughs> have to learn and then uh, these Indian people and so on. They all connected and it took 10 years. And when I was born, there's uh, Steven Pinker made a big book and nobody likes these kind of stories. So when I was born, life expectancy on this planet was 20 years less than today, whole planet. When I was born, uh, one out of four, around four billion people had been literate. Now it's eight billion, but seven billion are literate. And seven billion have these, uh, six billion have these mobile phones and are literate. It's incredible. My lifespan. Good. Now imagine this story. You know, the simple story, yeah? If energy, we thought it is, a, is the most simple story and most radical just to start a kind of theory about it. <laughs> it was, was a crazy misunderstanding. So the story was, if energy is not about resources or coal or something, if it's not about processes, so if it's just about intellect, that you are able to know how to do it, you don't have to take things. You simply have to write it. You have to write it in a proper way. <laughs> so what is here? Yeah? So you simply have this super thin material, and it can be uh, yeah, silicium, or you, this can be uh, organic stuff. It doesn't matter. And you put a certain pattern on it. It's like writing on a piece of paper. And we forget to, to, uh, to uh, yeah, it's always, al almost like magic if you start uh, writing at school, like the, the Greek people. So in Greek language is the language who came not with origin or a certain region and so on, it came with phonetical writing. This had been the people who had been able to write. So and they could, this is Greek. So, and they put an A, an R, and then you see all this rotating. And then you make T, you have an art, pop, it's here. It's from outer space, it's an alien, it's just there. Then you replace the R with an N. Then you have a small N. It's magic. <laughs> and it's like this. And then you have this uh, silicium, for example, then you have the phosphor, you make a pattern of phosphors, and then you make a pattern of bores, turn it a little, that's it. Put it to the sun, and you have electricity. It's like writing, you can make it, just because you know. As writing has nothing to do with resources. Of course, you need to be a piece of paper and some ink and so on. But in principle, the value of a book is not the paper. It's not the resources. It's the intellect. It's the same. But now with intellect, we get directly energy uh, from the sun. So, and if energy is just there, imagine that. And it's 10,000 times more than the, we are, the nature is uh, using and we are using every day, every year, and so on, 10,000 times. 
simply there. <laughs> so, now can you make these calculations? Very simple. So, if we think about energy as resources, for example, with oil or with gas or with wood, then in the last 150 years, we had an increase of costs of 7% per year, the price, because of scarcity. Because, and that's right, <coughs> we had this singularity some 10, 15 years ago, where mankind uses more energy than nature is able to encapsulate. So the, the principal stream of, of solar energy is, energy is coming to, uh, to our planet, and then the nature is encapsulating that. So then the trees are growing and, uh, and, and these kind of, so this, this is how it works. And then we burn the trees. So nature has a, <clears throat> has a ratio or efficiency of 0.1%. And we are using more of it since 10 years. So we had a singularity. We need more energy than nature is able to cover, uh, to get from the sun. So therefore, we need more energy than there are resources. That's, that's right. But with writing, you bypass it. It's like the ant, A-N-T. You bypass it by intellect. It's not with resources, you bypass it. Because you know, <laughs> it's not magic. <laughs> Simply do it. You have writing, and then there's an ant. Then there's electricity. Yeah. So therefore, if you look at the at the prices for energy by resources, getting expensive, and they are right, we, it's not working. So if you are in a thermodynamic things, for example, with wind turbines and so on, then the price goes down by 4% because of increase of productivity and so on. If you go to computer science by intellect, it's with uh, photovoltaic, it's down by 30% per year. So this is what they're all struggling with and only the Chinese understand that you can't build a factory <laughs> for a million if you don't sell two million at least per year, or five million. Because in two years, the factory is of no value anymore. You have to really fight these 30%. So and we see it with the computer screens, we see it with all the artifacts from, with, the, with, the, with the memory and so on. Photovoltaic is the same thing. Simply printed like newspapers. LCD screens project whatever you want, bandwidth and, and things, processor speed and so on. So and it's 30% per year. And it's the only thing which gets cheaper because we use more of it. It's clean and because we are using more of it, it's getting cheaper. So this doesn't like, and nobody likes it. And if you talk with it, we had a lot of interviews, 50, 60 run around with, with, um, <clears throat> with uh, NGOs and with different uh, companies and, 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 so, and, and with intellectuals and of, of different fields and so on. A lot, 60, 70 interviews. And a lot of them instantly uh, talk about the devil, get religious directly, it was very shocking. And if this not doesn't work, or if you have another kind of style, they talk about war. They simply say, say war will be the solution. One third of these interviews, if you take that and argue that for one, one and a half hours, you are at that point. Very astonishing. I was shocked with that. And by that I somehow understood it's dangerous if you put things upside down. And there's a kind of immune systems of our, of our society. And you can't get agitative in these things. So, just look at these numbers. So we, we, we did it around 2010. We say, okay, photovoltaic is 0.5%. Uh, now if you have every, 
like Moore's Law, 18 months double, same price, double performance. Then 2012. Okay. Yes, well, this is what we have today. Huh? The first days where we have all renewable energy somehow. <laughs> the, the, the first full days just with renewable energy and in, 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 in at least on, in, 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 in Germany. I, I don't know the numbers anymore. It's there. Now they get afraid of cheap nuclear uh, uh, electricity from France and they say then our subsidized uh, solar panels they are not worth anymore because the French are now having windmills in the, in the sea and selling us a cheap uh, nuclear plant. So th this kind of struggle, these are, these are the struggles and we are facing it, it's like that. Look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Bam. <laughs> like computers. There's no way. And it's not an ideological discussion. It's simply an, economics, an economic solution. So therefore I don't agitate anymore. Because it will come. It, it's coming like that. It will come. And it will be decided economically. Not by politicians, not by the green, but not by the environmentalists, just by the farmers, because, for example, <laughs> very simple. So a farmer, for example, in, in Germany, we'll give you some more numbers on that. For example, a typical farmer in Bavaria, so he has to make a, uh, he has to apply for, for 300,000 euros per year for new cows, for the, for the cows of the year. To, to, get all the milk and then sell the cows and then get a new cows and so on. By that he gets a kind of income of 100, 120,000 and so on over for the whole year work. But he needs to get 300,000 a year to buy new cows. <laughs> so, the system is if he makes, he asks not for 300,000 for the new cows but for photovoltaic on his farmland he will earn 120,000 euros as well with all these subsidiaries and so on. It's the same profit, but he can go to vacation. And next year he can build, buy another set of 300,000 photovoltaic and earn double. Or he can buy new cows. That's the status 2014, 2016. And therefore they're doing it. And it's a farmer's thinking. It's harvesting. It's not an industrial thing. Therefore, all these big energy providers going down. It's not about bureaucrats, it's not about institutions, and not about infrastructure. It's a farming thing. And they have to polish a little, then if something breaks, but a new one. So they used to do it with their glass houses. It's all the same processes. Tomatoes, glass houses, cows, all the same care for things working properly in mass, harvesting, sustainable, and so on. All these kind of things working with it. Okay, <clears throat> now with uh, some numbers. What does it mean if we have this amount of, en of en uh, energy? So, here, you need in Switzerland, three point five, all Switzerland, uh, Swiss numbers. Here's the same, I think it's better. So 3.5 square meters per one kilowatt hour per day. So you can find that easily uh, in internet. There's no, no complicated thing. So, so if you calculate the, elect the demand on electricity in Switzerland, you need 1.6% of the agricultural area to cover this demand. It's something like that. So these are solar cells. <laughs> and then you have it in Switzerland. If you say, yes, it's a logistical thing, and I don't, because it's like this, across Europe or across a few thousand kilometers, so that if there's a sun, I can get it, and so, and my fridge is able to talk, and so that's, of course, yeah, that's the, always the argument that this is not an infrastructure. No, it's a logistical system, and it's a marketplace. 
and we, we should build and, and work in this direction. This is not done for, I don't know, people don't like these ideas. But you see, it's not too bad, yeah? Just the amount of streets or something. This is comparable. So, the farmers would have 30% more income. Because electricity is one third of agricultural VIP. So if they make it, 30% more income, which means they don't need any more subsidiaries any longer. <laughs> close, close the power plants, <laughs> help them investing in electricity instead of cows, wait for five or 10 years, do it year by year, and then you don't need to sub more subsidiaries for the farmers if price of electricity keeps stable which will not be the case. <laughs> Very simple calculations. So, therefore, the electricity day is there. It was there 2014 and so on. You can calculate that. The same, by the way, with architecture. Around 2014, it was cheaper uh, to buy a solar tracker in Spain and have a cable to Switzerland than renovate uh, 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 a house, a Swiss house, or your apartment from the 1970s. So it's cheaper to have a solar tracker than new glasses, glassing for your windows. Uh, for your, you know, or makes these stupid insulations there. Buy a solar tracker, cheaper, uh, more environmental friendly, and so on. Nobody likes this idea. They all have this 2000 watt society, and so on. They're so proud of that. <laughs> And it would have, would have been so nice with, uh, with this freedom in, in architecture that you can... <laughs> Not this thick thing, sorry. So this was 2014, very clear. So, and you get all this with this 1.6, all the electricity to run everything what we know and what we like in different ways and so on. So, that's just electricity, 1.6%. So, you need 1.01 square meters for one liter desalinated water out of the ocean per day. Desalination today works very simple. You have uh, a kind of, this is relatively new, now it's about 15, 20 years old. You have a microfilter. You need a, a cylinder, put the microfilter there, put one water 15 meters high, put it on there, and if you have the pressure of 50 meter water, then the water is pressed throughout the, the filter and the salt keeps there because the molecules are of different size. Super simple. So put a pump into the ocean with this filter, just pump, <laughs> make uh, with the pump, with the electricity, make the pressure of the 15 meters and pump the water to the desert, up the rivers. Now water is running away and the water is coming because we want or we can. It's just coming, it's not flowing away. Clean water. just coming. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> if you want, it's coming. You can, can change it. <laughs> and it's, by the way, exactly the same like Archimedes with his, um, you know, the cylindrical uh, turbine, so to make the pump, so the water is flowing up the hill with him. The same kind of intellectual turn with Archimedes like we, we face here. That's very interesting as well. So, and you, for example, if you want to have uh, the desert, you can have <coughs> one solar tree with these 10% uh, efficiency leaves, other than nothing special, a farmer cleaning it a little. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's enough water for 22 real trees in the Sahara. And you get water like Switzerland. So you have 1,200, 1,600 millimeters per year. 
in the Sahara with one tree for 22 of his natural colleagues. Beautiful. Food. Yeah? By the way, this is very interesting as now we are with. I, I told this story with the food, yeah? So, what are you. For my, my, my colleagues in, uh, at ETH with the, uh, the, the agricultural guys, and we had there a year in Singapore, and then they like these rice fields, and they say, yes, we are lacking water, and so, and the rice fields need so much water, and uh, <clears throat> they struggle, and we face, we face war, you know, all these nice strategies to sell your thing, yeah? So, technology. So, and then. <laughs> then he likes to, to stay there in the rice field with his, uh, with his boots, with his, plastic, uh, with his rubber boots there, and then uh, with, the, with the farmers and say, yes, we have a lack of water, but yeah, the rice don't need this much water all the time. So we can measure that and make it more precise. So that we, have, we can save 30% of the water over a year and have the same amount of rice. So we have to control the size of the water. So we have to control it. That's good. So <laughs> and then uh, they control it, and they control it by having a, a hole near, near a PVC. That is very, very important. That this is only only 20 euro cents that you have a PVC uh, uh, tube for for the rain to put it into the ground, and then you can see the level of the water, whether you need more or not, and so on. So to control it, so that all the farmers in the region get enough and that this, it's, uh, it's um, in balance. So that was the first thing. It was, it's a good idea, huh? it's no problem. I don't, so the, <laughs> then, and this was his talk, yeah? and I couldn't talk about these talks. That, that's, so his talk was then, and he was serious in that. Three months later, the rice grew, and they couldn't find this PVC thing anymore. Yeah, complicated, huh? <laughs> to find that. And then he got a great idea. From his kid, he had this, um, this uh, wimple with this, or this orange triangle flag from the, from the bicycle. And he put it there. And then he said, now we can check the water, even if the rice grew. This was a paper. And he took half an hour to explain this story, and it was serious. I don't understand. <laughs> I really can't understand. <laughs> and I was not able to talk about these things, that water is coming, for example. Or, next nice stories, and therefore we gave up with, with all these farmers. So the interesting then is most of your food is processed, huh? I think 80% of the apples are juice. Huh? So, or now we uh, cut all the rainforest because of global hunger. So we are in food crisis. That's again the first, the f the, the first story huh? with these three, three gigantic heroes. So the first is scarcity. So we all have hunger. So we have the world population and we are hungry. Therefore, we can cut all the rainforest to make palm trees because we are hungry. So these palm trees, <laughs> it's awful. We, yeah, if you've seen that in Malaysia, it's, it's horrible what they're doing there for this ugly, uh, for this super primitive, cheap stuff. So it's processed. So you have a kind of oil and have it everywhere to get uh, enough nutrients. What you can do is, and we know it for, for, um, for 100 years, a Nobel Prize 100 years ago around on this, on the synthesis of sugar, on the synthesis of proteins. So we can have like the photosynthesis. So we can have uh, <clears throat> CO2 of the air, water from, from the rivers or from the ocean, and energy from the sun. And we can make sugar, we can make proteins, we can make oil with that. We know it for 100 years. This is organic chemistry. 
So we know how to do that. So if we have energy from the sun, we simply can do it. We can process the, the we can encapsulate and process the energy in a way that it's good for our body. So now we know with, with all the biologists, we even don't need gen genetic technology for that. We simply go with a microscope and cut these, these pieces, for example, of the palm tree or the palm beam and so, bean, and cut it and put it into this sugar water. So make it simple. So and then shake it <laughs> for two weeks. It's growing. It likes it. It's growing. And you get palm oil of, palm oil of that. You don't believe, but now we had a PhD and they made chocolate with it, without a tree or any, any cacao bean, and it's good chocolate. Just the, we don't want to save the planet, therefore, any longer, because with palm oil, we always say, yeah, but it's sheep, it's with one the factory, and so on. So you can make apple juice without any tree. So the, the, the attitude towards, what, what I'm telling, if you have an intellectual attitude, you get partner with nature. You don't have to treat them like that, like, like our farmers. So we don't have to cut all trees and we have to kill all insects and so on. We simply we can go around and get the most prestigious berries to make 80, 90 percent of what we need, processed food. And qualify with these, with these small cells of the most prestigious things all over the world qualify the principal generic source of energy we need in forms of proteins and, uh, and, uh, and sugar. Qualify them. Make them aromatic. Diversify them. This is what nature can do. We can contract nature. We don't have to harvest it. And we don't have to fight it. And because it's 10,000 times more, and with our actual technology, some one, 2,000 times more energy coming in from the sun, we can simply bypass, we can partner nature. We can make contracts with that. And it's a perfect life for that. So, you can't tell these stories. So I gave up, therefore we had in chocolate. <laughs> All this, huh? Good. Yeah, and the others are 10, 20 percent, but it's not a necessity. So it's a form of, uh, it's a form of sophistication, of uh, snobism, if you go for real food, yeah, of course. But the argumentation that from necessity you have to cut the rainforest to get palm oil, or whatever you like, and it's just your business, is simply nonsense. And we know that for 100 years, and I don't understand why we are so resistant with these things. So, it's about sophistication. It's good, I like that. But it's the same thing. Sophistication here, sophistication there, intellectual things, contracting things, cooking, brewing, whoop, and it's perfect. And there's, it's not about, about five, eight, 10, 20, 50 billion people or not. That's not the problem. The problem is whether we get it as an intellectual thing. And then if we, whether we can look to each other's eye and talk what we want to do with it without necessity. That's a problem. So gas, huh? synthesis of, uh, of gasoline, like oil. This. Audi is now doing it because it's a diesel uh, scandal. <laughs> they want to save the diesel, so we have to make this kind of solar, uh, solar gas. And you know, in the, in the North Sea, they have all these propellers, and they don't, they, they, yeah, they don't have the cable to the, to the land because the, the people don't like it. They think it's, it's, it's dangerous. And so there's a lot of energy they just put into the, in the ocean because the propellers have to turn. Now they're starting to make a guess with that Audi. This is known for 100 years that you can do it. It makes no sense to burn gas, to process gas, because then you lose half of it. But if you're in an abundance of clean energy, you make it. And then you get all this 
Yeah? Yeah, this is a photosynthesis. This is factor one, and we are right. We out, we, we, nature is not enough anymore for, for uh, our population and our needs. We are right. So this is factor one, photosynthesis, how to get the circle running with energy, food, and so on. Solar coming in, plants are growing, cut them, eat them, burn them, drive them, <laughs> whatever. It's not enough. And this is the same thing. It's factor 800 if you go to this uh, production of gas. 800 times more of it. So if you get all the gas, inclusive the, uh, the airplanes, the cars, the trucks, uh, and, and so on, of Switzerland, and you synthesize all the gas, you need 5% of the agricultural area in Switzerland. Not the total area, agricultural area. So, and this is 70% more income for the farmers. Therefore, the bio day, <laughs> or the, the biogas day, will be in, uh, in, in some six or eight years. It's cheaper to produce gas like this than to get it from Putin or from the sheikhs. Because minus 30% per year. So then you get all this for free. And then you can talk, is it, do you want that? Get all the... <laughs> so therefore, yeah. What we can do now is, if it's like that and there's no necessity, we have to decide. We have to do things. We have to say, what do we want? We have to agree on that. And this, I think, is the most architectural uh, attitude toward things. That in, not from, from uh, um, necessities, you turn towards contingencies. And you get stabilities in, in, in contingent situations. And you don't know how to behave. But you have to ask nature. You have to ask the other. We have to contract. Say, OK, good plan. Test it. Is it like that? And so on. But there's no necessity for optimization, but for whatever we always think it must be. And the most crazy thing is calculating CO2. Maybe it's, uh, it's important, most probably it's important, <laughs> but to say you are good or this project is good or this thing is good if, there's, if it's less CO2 and just, make, just, just navigate the planet and all humanity just with one number, good or bad, this is pure nonsense. This is an offense against uh, our human intellect. So, so and of course, we have to discuss that. But there's no necessity doing things. That's an important message. And this is a little frightening. So now concepts about the city. So, factor 10,000. Therefore, now, in summary, it's not about resources. Huh? It's not about scarcities. It's not about the territory. It's a logistical thing. It's rotating. It's recycling. So, for example, this story about the ecological footprint and the recycling. So, it's, the footprint is always here. It's, it's, so, it's there, and then you have it. It's, it's linear. Recycling is like this. So there's no limits in recycling. So there's no limit of growth on recycling. You can circulate very fast. So the footprint is not affected. So that the same, one of the same people directly says we do recycling and we believe in the footprint or in the 2000 watt society is a kind of nonsense. It's, it's a conceptual mismatch. You are either in cycles or in lines. So you can say 
there's a certain strategy to get things into cycles. You get angry about that things are not in cycles, so this kind of pollution and so on. But that's not the problem of ideology or of it's simply nonsense not to do things in cycles because then you run in problems with the footprint and with resources. So recycling is this. so. Therefore, it's not about territory. It's about recycling. Yeah. And it's not about efficiency. This is very, all the engineers get uh, uh, upset. All the politicians, all the Greens, is not efficiency. It's sophistication. <laughs> it is not about sustainability. <laughs> exactly not. Sustainability, in my definition, is you're always happy, like, like a farmer. Yeah, that's good. So a few percentage of a population has to do it like that. Otherwise, the machine doesn't work. Yeah? But and sustainability is doing tomorrow the same like yesterday. So I'm fighting for it, killing insects, <laughs> cutting things, and so on. And then this is sustainability. We always discuss that, I think. I'm not very fond of it. There was an aggressive uh, characterization of that. So I agree on that. But the point is, that's not the point. So, this should be done, so these farmers should have all these, uh, these machines, and should, these, these infrastructures should, should work, that's clear, so we need food, we need energy, we need hospitals and so on, that's right, but it's not about that, because this is done with the machines. So, and it's all about this complicated thing which is frightening us, this principal abundance, with it from outer space. It has nothing to do with our planet, nothing to do with nature, nothing to do with what we knew in our cultures and so on, because we hadn't these kind of situations before directly. It's abundance we are frightening of. So, and the only thing is, therefore I like, for example, I, in principle I like this first story about the three heroes and the scarcity, <laughs> scarcity catastrophe, technology. That's a nice uh, t uh, t trip, <laughs> because it's a strong story. Yeah? But it's a story, <laughs> and we need strong stories to agree on. Yeah? So, now, <clears throat> I think, it's about uh, the, the, uh, the city, how to do with it. So this is where you burn the surplus of the farmland. That's about the city. -ness. So you burn it, you burn it in sophistication, you burn it into uh, a contingency. So the city is not working in necessities. Farmers are working in necessities. City not. So therefore, there are a few... A few levels of that. So I would say, and this is, uh, yeah, for me as an architect urban in urban design and so on, these things are, I think, important to, to, to look at. So we have the mechanical system, uh, city. So, and uh, this is generating the idea about generating commonwealth by me the mechanical or mechanization of the ground. This is what we had from um, uh, 1500 to uh, 1700. So, the conceptions here is Hobbes, the Commonwealth, Smith, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. So it's about wealth. So you can see it here, Engram Viewer is a beautiful tool to look at it. You see this topic came, came up around, uh, so something here. Then it came up here, and wealth is somehow not changing, <laughs> somehow there. So, which is interesting. So, we have an implementation in form of mercantilism. These are the concepts playing around with this mechanical system. Uh, city, imperialism, nation, whatever it means. Interesting in contrast to other notions of that. So, the th okay, this one is crazy, okay, good. So the thinking is about the ground, the soil, 
and our uh, thinking about the ecological footprint is directly from there. It's in mathematics, it's about around the rational number, and it's proportional thinking. So this is what Club of Rome, all the um, bio people with a footprint <laughs> and so on, they tell us. They're arguing in these categories. So very simple proportions. So <laughs> one third of that. The growth of 10% makes in five years that. And so on. This is how they tell us these stories and of, uh, of catastrophes. And this story is really catastrophic, catastrophical. We had this with Maltos in 17, and this is a reference for the Club of Rome, the same mathematics, the same reference, it's, uh, and it's Maltos. It's the limit of growth if you think about resources. So if you have a, water with glass, uh, a glass with water, if you drink it, it will be empty, very clear. And there are certain formulas for that, and this is yeah, the reception of the emptiness. Something like that. That's a logarithm. <laughs> the invention of the logarithm by Euler around his time and Malthus. He simply says, he, Godwin was the first anarchist. He was his colleague at that time. And <laughs> Godwin was fighting for, uh, yeah, as an anarchist, to free the farmers and so on, give them more money, to educate them and so on. And um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the daughter of Godwin, um, uh, what is her name? Yeah, she wrote this novel about Frankenstein. That was very important. Huh? Mary Shelley. Yeah, Mary Shelley. This is the daughter of Baldwin. She made Frankenstein and so on. So, and Maltos was super angry about that. So this, this book here, the reference of the Club of Rome, Limit of Growth, <laughs> is Maltos. This book is not very big. It's 120, I don't know, 160 pages. Two thirds of it is fighting with Godfrey and saying, this is a mess what he's proposing there. We should not do that, and so on. Because, and these are the kind of arguments, and you see it's Club of Rome, it's the same kind of argument. So he says, if the farmers get more money, then they would, drink, get more kids, and all the wealth would be gone. It would be even worse than now. Therefore, it's good that the land law says what to do. So that's the story around. That's a big story of, of Malthus, and it's a big story of the Club of Rome. But not the master, but Western society. Selling technology to save our planet, directly. If you make this analogy around the same identical mathematics, that's it. And the beauty of that is that they put this formula, which always is catastrophic, it's clear, huh? Because if you have a glass of water and drink it and not refill it, it always will be catastrophically empty at the end. So it's the nature of this formula, of this logarithm. So and they put it in a computer, and they fed this computer with the whole world. That's it. <laughs> and of course there are catastrophes, because the formula can't do different. So they sold it for... 42 million times, it's incredible. We had two copies at my, at my parents' house. It's incredible. <laughs> I really like these, these uh, drawings with the typewriter, and these crosses and lines. <laughs> Beautiful, beautifully done with these, with these first uh, printers of computers and so on. So, that's uh, the, mini, uh, uh, the limits of the mechanical ground. So, and all of these things didn't happen because Around 1800, we left the mechanical city. So now it's about the dynamic city, or what I would say, urbanism. So this is around, if you go for economy, it's Ricardo, political economy. It's not about 
wealth anymore. You can look it up. It's political economy. It's economy, it's politics. And Mill, Stuart Mill. So you see complete different uh, schemes here on uh, political economy in, uh, in the um, frequency of this concept used. And that's very interesting as well. It's always, if there is something in the 19th century like this, we have a kind of shadow in, in the post-war. Look it up in these concepts. It's a very clear scheme, whatever you take. If you find a concept which has 19th century strong uh, thing here, get a shadow of that in the last 50 years. Yeah, so concepts there is capitalism, nation state, infrastructure, nature. And you can look it up in uh, Ngram Viewer as well. These are the prominent concepts delivered, uh, uh, developed 19th century. Landscape, whatever, all these things we like. <laughs> and they have these shadows in today. So, and it's not about <coughs> common wealth, it's about the creation of wealth. And it's industrialization, capitalism, and so on. So, therefore, the thinking turned completely from the soil to capital, from the rational to real numbers, from proportionality to rationality, from the central, sensible intellectual uh, to the central intellectual human. This is what Kant introduced in the, uh, around 1800, uh, in, the, in the 18th, 18th century. So the human is centered. So the limit, it's a little odd now, I'm just mimicking these, uh, these Club of Rome curves of Maltus. <laughs> it's not adequate because it's just with the mechanical city, now with the dynamical capital, it's, uh, you need another mathematics to show that. And this is a kind of dissolving, it's uh, entropy which means that things in balance, they die in harmony. So it's the Kälte oder Wärme tot. So people got very, so you're always um, uh, balancing energy, or losing energy, and then everything is dead because it's balanced. And that's a conceptual dead end of the dynamic capital. And then you can find this figure and all these intellectual with Marx and so on, Marxism is just fighting the thing. So we have uh, Carnot, Clausius, Darwin, these stories. So, and this is what we are celebrating today. We have this green story. We, uh, we, have, we are celebrating entropy so that these differences go away. We fight the city. We want to be farmers, we want to be in harmony. That's an entropic dream in the shadow of nature, <laughs> of uh, uh, political economy and so on. So and then it gets this generic. This is the most healthy and the most sustainable food you can get. So less energy needed for that. The, the fewest footprint you can get is just this food. This is what we don't like. We want to have yeah, these super juicy things from all over the world, and then we put it in a plastic bag, then it should be fresh by the, by the hour, and we say, innocent. Yeah? <laughs> That's the most prestigious luxury things. <laughs> so if you calculate, you have to eat that all day. <laughs> put in some pills and that's it. <laughs> Very simple. You see how schizophrenic the situation is. So, and we have these kind of buildings. It's awful. And we still continue that and we like that. 
So, or this guy. You now we had one of these interviews in, in, in Iceland because they have this abundance of energy. We, we left, run around there and had a lot of interviews in Iceland because of the abundance. So they, they should be somehow deal with it with, these, with this conception of abundance. But they are frustrated. So the intellect, very few intellectuals, uh, they are frustrated with it. Most of them don't understand the question as well. And this is a story of, of one filmmaker he told us. <laughs> there, is a, there is a village in the far east of East Iceland. And they own 300 miles or 200 miles of the ocean. And because there is nobody, there's a lot of fish, a very, a very lot of fish. <laughs> and so, so these 300 people there, they own hectatons of fish. <laughs> so, and, and, so, so they sell it and so on. So they're super rich, more rich, rich than the Saudis, and it's it's recycling. So it's not once. Yeah? The Saudis just getting the oil. It's a kind of it, it's growing and it's of value. And 300 people with 300,000 tons of fish every year or something like that. So, so and they say <laughs> they drive. If you visit, we had not visited that. If you visit this this village, it must be super ugly. So you have these American-sized cars with wheels like that. They drive, and if there's a new volcano, they go and make sightseeing for the new. Say hello to the new volcano, <laughs> driving there. So, and they have the most worst supermarket and very, <laughs> very primitive wooden uh, houses. And they say, we are poor. We only have fish. It's like that. It's crazy. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so now the third level. This is what I think we are in, and this is how somehow we have to, there's a need to cultivate that, this kind of thinking. So it's not a mechanical ground, it's a quantum mechanical ground, and it's about common wealth again. So we have to learn that. <clears throat> so. And if you look at the economy, then it's Keynes, then this famous uh, uh, Hay, Hayes, Hayek, wrong, Friedman, and uh, then it's about employ theory of employment, then it's a pretense of knowledge. This is a, the kind of manieristic, um, this, therefore nobody knows really what to do with, with Hayek. It's, um, it's this manieristic or transcendental uh, vector of, of, rotating, of rotating Keynes and Friedman. I'm super fascinated with that. So he's, he's in, in, in the middle of that. And then the quantity of, uh, of, of money with Friedman. These are the, the buzzwords in, uh, in economy for that time. And then, for example, you directly see that socialism and capitalism are 20th century. It's a concept of the recent uh, world. <clears throat> so then we have uh, generalism, international organizations, computing and internet, inclusive the energy story I told you and so on. And they have not the limits we are facing with the limit of growth or with entropies. They are of another nature. So, in capit from capital then to the uh, quantity of money, from the real to complex numbers, from rationality to probability, and from the intellectual human to the human intellect, in strong contrast to the machinic intellect. I'm very happy with that because this is a kind of solution to my problem with this Turing test. Yeah? <laughs> so, if this is the limit of growth of resources, 1800, Entropy is around 1900, limits of balances, and this is what we are currently in. And we left that with these new conceptions, with these new techniques, with this new writing we have. So, so and therefore it's all about, yeah, it's about the human intellect. So it's like with, um, with Descartes, yeah? I'm thinking, therefore, I, I, yeah, I'm, I am. Yeah, 
It's all about urbanity, the city. It's not urbanism, which is the, the, uh, the dynamic thing. It's always the inverse of urbanity uh, is urbanism. Yeah? And I would say with the Greek philosophers, <laughs> it's a love affair. You have to get out of pragmatism because it's a dynamic game and this ends up in entropy. It's a love affair and it's intellectual. And I like this, uh, this, it's all about love. And this is how we behave today. So we are like this. <laughs> I really don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and then we are celebrating crashes and uh, transformers and technologies and te uh, machines taking over and so on, but only in media. And yeah, and it's getting more and more boring in the, in the, in the cities because it's getting farming places. So yeah, urbanism. So it's clear that tomorrow it will be the same like Lister Day all around and we are very happy with that, like farmers of this kind of, yeah. But nevertheless, yeah, these are the things in our cities, the kind of crazy, fantastic things happening around. So this is like this. <laughs> There's no discussion about anything. It's a, yeah, super athletic. This is with our machine. So our machines can make better uh, design than that in cities. But at this here, and you have this kind of sophistication in our city. So it's all around, but it's complicated to find to to get orientation to these contingencies. You have to find that, and you can't pressure it. It has this prestigious, It's rare, sophisticated, delicate. Grotesque, whatever. So this is about the city. We think, not look. Japan, it's incredible how they <laughs> The qualification of spaces. It's not about the quantity. And that's it, my story about the abundance of energy. <laughs> Thank you. So that's, that's a lot to unpack. Um, I hope you stay for a discussion which um, probably many of you during the talk um, understood why, why Lutka had trouble publishing his book. <laughs> because there are so many things that robbed probably all of you. <laughs> and, but there are so many things, so it's hard to know where to start. I, so I, I, like usual, I, I will try and make the start and start with this, you know, the, the, your optimistic m um, message about solar cells that you know, people are now starting to see what you could already say in 2012, and it's 2018, how that percentage is growing. And that story still seems pretty crazy, the way you, you tell it. But maybe what I would take issue with is that just these numbers just make it sound too simple, right? Yes, this, this development is happening, but there are so many other things that need to fall in place in order to make this happen. So there is politics, there is all this infrastructure side of it that has to fall in place as well. How optimistic are you about these things just sorting themselves out? That you, do you believe in those numbers yourself? No, I believe in the numbers. But I'm, uh, I'm super frustra as a, yeah, frustrated with the uh, abrupt uh, political development, which have the same reason. Huh? So the way how, we, how drastic and ignorant we currently react to these uh, things, uh, I'm very shocked. So this is what I didn't expect. 
as well as I didn't expect this kind of immune system from all the intellectuals we talked to in some for six, eight years ago and so on. It was a, there's a super a strong immune system. And now we are facing it in politics. So people are simply afraid. And before simply starting to say, if it's like that, why are we struggling about water? Why are we afraid of it? And so why don't we do proper things? Why, for example, yeah, with, with all these, if it's with this electricity like that, why do we spend this much? Uh, yeah, why don't we have get these uh, networks as networks? As lo why don't we think about our our energy networks as logistical infrastructures instead of a kinds of distribution? So that this is so instead of reflecting that and investing in proper proper uh, uh, things and proper technical developments and uh, putting the, the enormous amount of money and wealth we have, putting it in a proper direction so that these things can stabilize. We simply clash. So, and we, nobody talks anymore. So this is what I really, I, I'm shocked with. So, so, yeah, of course, it's complicated, it's dangerous. Like always in these times. Ich, ich, ich vielleicht auch zum Sagen, wir können hier gern die, die Diskussion auf Deutsch führen, wenn das für äh, die, also wenn das leichter ist. So we have some people that prefer English, but we can, I think, for Lutke it's the same to have it in, 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 in German, of course. Ähm, vielleicht gibt es auch äh, Verständnisfragen, weil, also ich, äh, Ich möchte gerne hier das Wort auch weitergeben, wo Sie das Gefühl haben, ja, aber so kann man das doch nicht sagen, ähm, da, da, dass man jetzt nachhaken möchte, was er da behauptet hat, was hat er da gemeint genau damit? Oder äh, wem kann ich da das Wort geben dafür? Anybody ready to ask questions? Bitte. Für die Solarzellen braucht es ja auch Rohstoffe. Und wo kommen denn die her? Kann, können die auch wieder verwertet werden? Ja, Gewisse aber Rohstoffe klar, kann man ja nicht in einem Zyklus betrachten. Also das glaube ich ist, also ich I think you can put everything in cycles. So that's, it makes, sometimes it makes no sense, you can wait with it and so on, but I think you can put whatever you like in cycles. So that's, I think it's, it's very principled. So you can recycle everything, but it makes no sense in, in, in a lot of cases. So then it's true, and this is a very common argument, that these solar cells, if you put them on silicium, they take a lot of uh, energy to produce them. So the, then if you want to put them to high efficiency, you need very rare uh, elements, chemical elements. So, and uh, you run into the risk that you get out of that. You have resources there as well, even if you don't only need a very few tons or something. So you still have then problems there. But I think, so, the moment these solar cells produce more energy than they, for their production, than there's needed for their production, I think it's not a problem, not a principal problem, because there's a plus of energy, so you don't destroy, as you don't lose energy, you have this plus of energy, and uh, whatever you take, I think always these uh, solar cells produce more, properly used, produce more than it's used for their production. So even with, if you have these uh, super, energy expensive uh, uh, silicium stuff, because you have to, to make these crystals and they need super high temperature and so on. So as you see with um, the uh, LCD screens, which are silicium, and now with OLEDs, maybe with organic stuff, we are about to do it with organic material. So this can be cooked. So this pure synthetic energy, then this bypass of nature. There is no resource question of resource anymore. These OLEDs and the inverse thing is the uh, organic uh, photovoltaic. They have problems that they don't last it any longer. So, but the principal problem is not there. So you can cook them like whatever you can cook. 
And there's not a question then on, uh, on, on resources anymore. So I would agree it makes no sense to recycle these thin foils. So, but on the other hand, I think what, of course, always this can be improved and there is, of course, you need some resources and so on, but yeah, for example, yeah, this is a very simple calculation I, I did then. So in 2012, you could buy a solar factory. This is what the Chinese did. So a solar factory for 500 million Swiss francs with a Swiss company. So this solar factory costs 500 million. It takes 18 months to put it, implement it somewhere on uh, this factory for solar cells on this planet. So 18 months. So then this, solar, this, uh, this factory is able to produce a quarter of uh, the, the, the capacity of solar cells of, uh, of one single nuclear plant. So you have four years of operation, and then you have the solar cells which compensates one nuclear plant. So it costs you 500,000 plus 500 million plus <laughs> four years, so it's five and a half or six years, and you have the equivalent for a nuclear plant, and it's about a billion or something. So if you want to buy a new nuclear plant, you even take for just getting all the certificates, you need triple time, triple money, and so on. And this machine simply can, can continue running. So and these are the calculations, I, I, I don't know. And this is increasing and we are lear just learning it. It's not, so we can learn these industrial processes and I'm very optimistic that that's simply not the problem. L like writing, so when the first you wrote with papyrus and then we got this super cheap uh, paper and then you get uh, certain inks and all this is improving. As I don't see any problem with that in relation to what we have with that, what we get. You always can make this argument, of course, but I think it's marginal. It's not the point. So somebody else <laughs> who is skeptical. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have another question that is uh, on top of the previous question, because I have that question also on my list. Um, and that would be if the resources are not the limit, then actually that would mean that once again soil or land will become the currency or sets the limit of what mankind or what humanity can reach and um, yeah. can produce. Yeah. So we're getting back actually into a soil-based uh, society yeah. somehow. But, this is what we are but on a higher level of efficiency. Yeah. 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 Okay. We, are, we are rotating on soil, yes. And therefore, I call that the quantum mechanical ground. So it had been a mechanical ground in mercantilism in the, uh, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. It has been a mechanical ground. This is what Malthus is fighting for. And this is what an ecological footprint currently is because of the rational numbers on the surface of the, of, of the planet. So putting the surface of a planet in ratio and clear proportion to the amount of people, to the, what they eat and so on, and then you get a footprint. So it's pure uh, mercantilism. So and there you have this mechanical footprint. So then we have these dynamical systems in the industrialization. And that's, that's about the creation of wealth. So they're not talking about uh, ground at all. It's just about nature. So we're mixing this up. And now we are back in ground. So, but we have a quantum ground. And this is what we experience. Everybody is traveling, we have Airbnb, and so we, have it, we ourselves are rotating all the time. So it's not the problem. So, and... Uh what do you think is the, the limit that, um, based on, 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 um, on the quantum ground? Okay. So <clears throat> then, uh, if we uh, if we have this uh, proportional, rational view to that, and if you calculate that, then we have this number ten thousand, ten thousand extra natures. That's the rational number, the uh, proportion. 
So which means we would have 50,000 billion people, so, which is absurd. Huh? <laughs> so this in, in our actual uh, situation, something like that. So this is absurd. This calculation is absurd because it's uh, rational thinking. So the quantum problem is that we have to learn to think and trust in our intellect what we'd want to do and how to negotiate, how to contract and so on, how to make our societies, how to circulate things, how to collaborate in, in the quantum ground. So we have to cultivate the quantum ground and not in a mechanical way because a mechanical way clashes. It's not enough. We're all right. But this is what we experience now with social media and all this stuff. Everybody is traveling around and so on. At our university, three out of 16 PhDs are only German. 13 from 16 are, uh, are non-German speakers in a German-speaking country. It's, it, that's new. I grew up in a complete different world. And we are, we are, we are starting to cultivate that. That's what we are, and therefore people got afraid. It's turning all things. And this is the limit. It's our intellect that we are not willing to think adequately and okay. expose ourselves to this uh, situation, which is contingent, which means we don't know. Nobody knows. Okay, thank you. Hello. Um, actually, his question was a rather a good intro for my question, oh, which would be... <laughs> more in a physical, uh, um, in a conceptual way. Do you believe, because you mentioned that the mechanical city, concept of mechanical city had a uh, face the limitation of growth, so we shifted to another paradigm, a dynamic city, which then faced the limit of balance, and then we s switch now to this quantum city, which is driven by our intellect. Do you have a feeling that we will and we are able to reach the limit of our intellect like a driver and what happens with the civilization when we reach this limit once in Yeah, but we did that. So, um, this is always a phase of renaissance, huh? that we face ourselves in the new world. So, it had been with the mechanical work, mercantilism, and so on as well. This is what we call renaissance. So it's, it, it's a Wiedergeburt. So we are there and out of the sudden, yeah, we, but do you, do we are super believe? powerful, then there was imperialism, mercantilism, and so on. So and then Descartes says, yeah, <laughs> this is about the intellect and, and, and so on. So this is what you're facing. Then you go from renaissance to baroque and somehow a, a saturation of the intellectual capacity or understanding. So then it's a kind of saturation of the intellectual understanding of this new world is the manieristic, also the end phase of Baroque. And you leave that with enlightenment phases. So this what we faced in the, this was towards the dynamic thing. And then the story is different. Then it's not the intellect, the human intellect, but the intellectual human. So and then it's about, <laughs> how to behave to get things in, in, in balance and so on. That's a completely different cultural setup. So we faced that several times in our cultural history. But you believe that there is endless number of renaissance possible? So there is no last renaissance or... No, uh, why? This is again the, a dynamic... It was just a... No, no, uh, this is the story of the dynamic thinking. So this is, and this is always the cause reason. So if you go with this direction and, and stories of progress, then you have these limits and then you say, okay, everything is in balance, it's entropic things, and then you have this final uh, uh, behavior. And this, if you have that, it's a clear symptom that you can make a new step to another world. Just go beyond... The, uh, the entropic state of balance. And then everybody, so this is what we are facing for 100 years now, I think. So we had that in the nations, and I think Greek society and antique had the same phenomena in contrast to the Egyptian and Babylonian uh, setup. And upcoming of Christianity is a kind of enlightenment. So we have symmetries in our culture and can learn from that. And I don't think there is principal limits. Why? Not the next, yeah. Who cares? Always this takes a few hundred years. So we, if it's like that, we're just entering a, a kind of digital or quantum baroque 
So it will take 150 years, 200 at least. Yeah. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> throw it, but carry it. Thank you. Uh, why do you use uh, the word city and not territory? You, you, you seem to um, you, you explain us these different cities, but how do you consider the transformation of what is not a city, the whole, the rest? <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, I'm always not sure with these things. So I'm, I trust in these symmetries. So, and uh, by that, these things get uh, uh, stable and so on. I'm not very sure. I would say the concept of the territory is farmer's land in a, in a society where cities are, are growing. So that's the not, not the city. Therefore, the city is not territorial. I would, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure. We have to check that with Engram Viewer, with the, with with uh, with the uh, key books and the things, and you have to check who is uh, how to use these terms in different languages. Always, for example, uh, in in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, f what what is a, f a face? It's orthogonal, so in, so like sinus and cosinus. If you have these uh, prominences of certain concepts. In French and in, in, in English, it's always <laughs> diverse. So then, you, so then uh, French invent certain things, and if the French are uh, of these are these kind of circles, if they if they somehow understood that, then on from another perspective, the English language takes it, and it's not that in their context always like this. It's working in different phases. Very interesting, and then you can, for example, territory is one of these, these concepts which uh, is very important. Of I think of a long time, mm -hmm. and it needs more research on that. But my my hypothesis would be, it's not the city, mm -hmm. which means it's the uh, sustainable farmland of our time, which is needed to feed the city. So something like that. But this is super. I don't know. Risky. This will be a hypothesis. More doubters, questions? Huh? Our guest from Vienna, do you have any questions? No. We, we, I don't think we, we should wrap up yet. I, um, let's see. Um, how am I, I going to put this? Um, the, you, your story is a, a very optimistic one, basically. It's all we're we're on a pathway towards. Uh, a world where sophistication matters and intellect matters most. And yet, who... We know that right now everything goes the other way. You know, it's like um, success in politics is... So it's, it's almost like it's, it's the opposite of the story you're telling is what, what's going no, to happen. No, the machines take over. That's interesting. So we are happy about that machines take over. So this nonsense Trump, for example, is telling is just made by machines. So they are super smart machines of very few people, and they get super powerful just having this uh, and this kind of principle talks. Everybody uh, repeats. So he has a coverage in media which is insane, which is produced by machines. It's a it's a feedback in uh, our mach okay. on our machines. So what about the distribution of power in this world then, hmm? and the control of power? Who has control, and is that yeah. will democracy so, still be the there, adequate way? Yeah, of but you see what, what democracy is, and so on. And in phases, if we follow these kind of symmetries, uh, in phases like ours, people who do powerful things are the smart, in principle, or the people behind that who drive that. They understand that they are smart and they are aggressive, 
and they simply do that, and they get power, and these, are, these people are called tyrants, and they are the drivers. So and the solution for that is education. The only thing to face a tyrant is to understand what he's doing and say no, or do similar things, or uh, 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 fight it somehow. So you have to get a person. You have to understand and you have to be able to talk. You have to know what's going on. And this is what we can learn from, from, from history. You can blame them in principle. Yeah, of course it's unethic. So, but the problem is that we don't know what they're doing because we are not aware. This crazy story there with Cambridge Analytica. So the, it's two years ago and so on it somehow came, came up what they're doing. It was absolutely clear for, for us that you are able, we, we, I can do that, we are doing things like, so we simply do it. It's, it's a business model of all these social media platforms that you, uh, it's, it's, it's just the model of you if you go to Facebook to publish your stuff. You can't, be, can't say it's unethical that somebody is reading your stuff and making it in a professional way. No, that, that's what it is about presenting your stuff to the world, and you're happy if you get all the likes and so on. So why not have a machine, and these machines are saying like, 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 and you get happy. But this machine is a machine, and it's playing an unethical game. So, it's, so the problem is that nobody is aware of it. So two years ago, when we realized that there is a Cambridge Analytica is, that I was shocked that with these kind of technology, somebody is making business with these awful kind of things. So that he's simply ma making business with it. It's, I, I, I couldn't understand that. It was unethical, and I was shocked. So the problem now is, and we have to, so still nobody understands what's going on. <laughs> it's about privacy, it's about these kind of of, of uh, IT and so on, and then now we start to criminalize this, this, these people. Then we have this fake whistleblower. So it was no, no it, it simply was not uh, hidden. Nobody looked at it. And then we have this crazy whistleblower who, who, who told that to the world, then they, we got criminalized, and, and so on. The problem is, and then we say, this is not what we wanted. And then you punish them. So the problem is that two years, five years, ten years ago, we didn't, hadn't been aware that these things are there. And we are not aware what can be done. And discuss in a reasonable amount of people, be able to discuss what's going on and what is ethic and what not. And now it, some by, by, by chance something pops up and then it's a kind of sacrifice. They sacrifice them, kill this and that, and so on, because we don't like it. But there's no words to discuss these things. We simply say it's criminal. And then this next thing will happen. And this is why the, the, the tyrants get powerful, because nobody knows what's going on. And they say, I don't like it, but it's not enough. So it's, it's not automatic that everything no. will turn out well. No. The, no. The, the risk is that we don't trust our intellect. And that's an intellectual problem. It's not mm -hmm. the big and bad guys on capital. Capitalism is dead for 100 years. It's a super social democratic uh, 20th century. Everything is social democratic. And we don't take a responsibility for that. We always think the bad, big guys, everybody is dead. It's us, which makes 80, 90% of society in economy and everything. So we can say we are treated badly. Volkswagen is, is uh, socialized. It's not the company. So it's us. Two million families or something simply involved in this stuff. There's no big guy earning Volkswagen. It's just a, a socialized system. And it's with most of these companies, especially here in Europe. We can't excuse ourselves and say, this is bad, we don't want it, and it's criminal, and so on. We have to understand how this machine works and making our point and say, we want to have it like that. And that's, I think, is a risk with this abundance. We are facing that. It's super powerful, everything. And by that, dangerous.
Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, now we can face that fact because you're just coming from another age, I can see, and then now we can face that fact and then we can compare. And what about the new generation? The new generation, internet generation, they cannot really compare. They just got the, all of the information of the internet. How they can develop and what do you think? Yeah, but we are teachers, we have to teach them. This is what universities are, what schools are, this is how generations work. And it's good, and so I don't know any solution for that. And they somehow grew up with that and it's different. I can tell my stories and they will have different stories. Therefore, I think it's, it's really a love affair. That's important. <laughs> it's not a problem. If a problem is a kind of imperialistic uh, gesture, you always say, that's a problem, that's your problem, I solve it, pay, or I make it for free, you have to be thankful, or something like that. No, it's, it's uh, you have to be in love with these things. Uh, the second question would be rather uh, regarding your statement that if the machines overtake the organization, they are 10 times or 100 times more efficient than human. Uh, what are the dangers connected with this overtake? Is it, should we like blindly trust the machines? No. And what would, what would be an impact of overtaking on uh, no, development the of the human? With, uh, I think it's the same way, therefore I like this idea that urbanism is farming, huh? It's a kind of industrial farming. So all these, these, um, these uh, dynamic city or urbanism, this is what the machines take, it's farming. So we, what we face is that uh, our, it makes no, our ground is industrial. It's capitalistic. Therefore, I'm always with these, uh, so, and we have to, we are facing that. So, and it's really like farming. It makes no difference whether you go to, to the Netherlands with tomatoes in a glass house or go to China with the mobile phones. It's, it's simply doing the more the same amount of tomatoes and to, as at mobile phones like yesterday. So, it's, it's sustainable. They're simply doing it. So, and then you go to these data centers, Amazon, they're simply doing it. It's always, it's, it's farming and it's all the same. People going there in the morning, who keep making all the same, same thing and then take putting and, and, and then getting out of insects or cleaning the air, whatever. So it's all the same thing and taking out things all the time the same. So and we somehow managed that, for example, with our food, which is a super risky thing, we, 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 uh, did, we, we gave it to 2%, 3% of our population. And they're doing it and we trust them and somehow it works. And it will be the same with these industrial things. It will be very few percents, and we trust them that it's working with the machines. And we somehow socialize, domesticate it, and all about, it's all about that. And the cities are breeding ground for the new things, <laughs> which are contingent, not necessary. Therefore, it's so important not to talk about urbanism, but about the city and not being afraid that we get out of, of, of work. No, we never got out of work. Not in our history. It would be stupid. We get bored. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will ask a short question. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, positive statements. I like them very much. But um, there's a, a famous saying uh, hopefully I can translate it in English. Um, there are only two constants in the universe. This is death and stupidity. If I compare this with your <laughs> statements. <laughs> Which is an entropic statement, huh? <laughs> Directly with the dynamic uh, and urbanism, this entropic and yeah, of course, you can say that. With all the reasons of this world, but I don't like it. <laughs> And I don't, I think there's enough indicators, so as I told you, to make another story, which I like more. I don't like these dystropic things, and sarcastic, and so on. Therefore, I'm looking for other stories, and it's just big storytelling. So let's end with the love affair. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Can we wrap up now? Let's please join me in.